Anthony Elmer Kroll of East Harwich, who was once a cranberry farmer himself, was able to bridge the gap from traditional seasonal cape work to establishing a world-renowned reputation as a carver and painter of birds. His fame was justly acquired from the superb lifelike decoys he made and sold to the wealthy hunters he worked for here on the Cape and in hunting camps outside of Boston. Decorative or ornamental carvings were a natural whimsical sideline, which were soon in as much demand as his decoys. His clients ranged from Henry Ford to his next door neighbors. However, his fame and most important sales were to the wealthy tourists and hunters. He and his son Cleon produced hundreds of decoys and ornamental birds from the first decade of this century. He called his shop the Songless Aviary and is generally credited with the actual invention of decorative bird carving. Here he is seen with his son, working in the shop in East Harwich. Both are shown starting with a rough sawn block which is whittled to shape with quick decisive strokes. After sanding, the miniatures receive several coats of paint and are mounted on stands. Good afternoon. We're here today to speak to Jane Walker. She lives in Howard and has for the whole, her whole life, I believe. I have. And she has some childhood memories she'd like to share with us uh, regarding El McCroll and some of his uh, children, I believe. And grandchildren. And grandchildren. So, Jane, why don't you just start, start to talk to us about some of your memories uh, around the Kroll uh, homestead here in Howard, and what you recall of his bird carving, mm -hmm. and uh, a little bit maybe of some of his hunting, mm -hmm. and whatever else you would like to talk to us about. So, when you would go into the barn, mm -hmm. and Elmer would be in there painting or carving, do you recall any of the things that you may have seen in his workshop, on the walls? Did he display his bird patterns? I don't remember anything like a pattern. I remember a mess. A mess. <laughs> Sounds like a fellow's place. <laughs> like, like you would expect, you know, to be cutting wood, you got wood shavings. And I would say it was an upheaval that was stuck. Do you think it was organized chaos? For him, yeah. he might have thought it was organized, <laughs> but that's the only memory <laughs> I have of it. I think, and it's very vague, but I think he had a place in his own home, his house, mm -hmm. where he carved and worked or painted. And I think perhaps it might have been because it was when it got cold. Mm -hmm. Well, I know his workshop did not have any source of heat other than um, what we might call a Franklin stove or yeah. a pot belly yes. stove, and it would probably burn wood if it wasn't too cold. You, you mentioned earlier that your father was a contemporary of Cleon's. They were about the same age. Yes, I did, would think so. Did they socialize? Did the families oh, get course, together? Of course, of course. Everybody socialized. East Howard, uh, down south in the boonies, you know, no one ever wanted to live in East Howard. It was like you were banned to that part of the world. <laughs> well, now I chuckle. Well. I want to thank you for sharing some of your memories with us today. And we appreciate the hospitality you've shown us, allowing us to come to your home to speak oh, with you my pleasure. about Elma Kroll and your memories as a young girl. My pleasure. Thank you. We've been talking with Jane Walker of East Harwich, which is no longer considered a wilderness. Thank you. Good morning. We're here today to talk with June Buckwell, Howard's resident, who has memories of Elma Kroll as she was a young girl growing up in Howard. How are you today, Jewel? Fine. Nice thank you very much nice for inviting me. Nice to have you with me. us, and thank you for doing this interview. Thank we you for inviting me. Well, we appreciate it. We look forward to keeping the history of 
Elmer Crawl alive. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and we spent many, many mm -hmm. days together playing in the neighborhood, uh, going over to visit Grandpa and Grandma, and of course in the workshop with Elma, who was in there most every day, whittling away. And I can just picture him as a, I won't say rotund because that's not the word, but just a cheery gentleman that was always willing to share what he was doing, his love for birds, uh, how he carved or would hand us a knife and say, would you like to whittle or would you like to do this? And he had, I would call them uh, patterns on the wall, patterns, mm -hmm. and he would always uh, show us how he was going to paint them and how he would feather uh, the birds when they were done. But the recollection is basically of a, of a jolly, very, very wonderful man uh, that was a wonderful grandfather and a wonderful person to me as well. Um, Peggy always had a hoss, so there was also a stable adjacent, and sometimes the uh, shavings from the uh, carvings and so forth, when they would pile up, if they didn't go in the wood stove, which was in the uh, workshop, then they went out into the uh, little stable, and uh, he came out and helped to feed or hay the hoss or whatever. I also remember at one time, his uh, Peggy's mother uh, had a, a lovely convertible. It was it was really something, and it, we went with him to Eastwood Hall. I recall he had decoys at the time, and there was a bird blind there, or what I would call a bird blind. And we all got out, and we we just watched the little ducks. Of course, I have no idea what they were or anything. I know they were ducks or geese or whatever going around and he would adjust them and whittle a little bit and then we got in the car and came home. He was also, I believe, an avid hunter, a uh, 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 waterfowl guide, a guide, a hunting guide. There was a camp on Hawk's Nest Pond mm -hmm. and he was very instrumental in getting hunters, fellow companions uh, together. I recall people being around the um, workshop when I say people men and they were talking about decoys or the whatever we as youngsters uh, probably were invasive or just seeing what was going on although we probably didn't know very much about it. Doing. But uh, again I, rem I can just picture him in his workshop with shavings at his feet and, uh, and uh, 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 just a nice fellow. He wore glasses, he took them on and off, put them down on the on the table, uh, always had his chair turned away from the table, as I recollect, but he was always whittling, very anxious to uh, tell us about his work, again, showing us how to carve, how to paint, how to feather. I think he would like for Peggy to have had more of an interest in that, his, his great-granddaughter. I don't believe she ever did, but she was a great artist. She could paint birds, she could do a, a, a great deal of work. She had a great artistic ability. Um, I remember Clean, Clean being at the house, and I'm not sure whether Clean and his wife Nellie Mae lived there um, full time after um, Alma's wife passed on, I'm not sure, but Clean was there. Clean was a tall, stately gentleman where Alma was Again, a, a little, little chunky. Mm -hmm. uh, I go back to Alma for a, a moment. I recall the black pants that he always wore, and I don't know why I would recall that, but at the time, they, it just seemed different. They were shot. We always thought his pants were too, too shot, short. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't. It was typical. I, I don't think Nick is the right word for it, but it was typical of, of what men wore at that time, right. and his suspenders, and again, his glasses, but again, a clean was a stately man, as I recall, a tall man. He, he, he did fine. He was carving along with his dad on occasion. I recall Clean more in Howichport. He did live on Helena Avenue in Howichport, uh -huh. and Peggy 
his granddaughter, Quinn's granddaughter, Peggy, and I would go over there for dinner or whatever. We would always view the birds that he had done and his paintings and so forth. But I think Quinn painted more songbirds mm -hmm. than he, and I, I don't recall mm -hmm. any decoys or, or waterfowl shorebirds or anything of that, but the beautiful little, I don't know, siskins and chickadees right. and uh, very detailed they were. Uh, I think his, his well, I, I don't say his flow wasn't as soft as Elma's. Elma had a certain way, I think, of just blending everything in. It was a right. very natural uh, ability, yeah. but they, they were both good. Yeah, and, I, I, and we've been talking today with Jewel Buckwall, who has fond memories from her childhood of uh, being in his workshop. Thank you for watching our video today.